Thanks for listening today. Don't forget to subscribe and share this episode. My guest today is Christine McAllister. She's a business coach for high achievers who want to make six figures running an online business. Christine helps her clients overcome doubt and make progress towards their dream life. Thanks for being on the show today, Christine. Thank you so much for having me. So I'm excited to dig a little bit deeper about your journey, how you became who you are today. So if you don't mind sharing with the listeners uh, a little bit backstory about how you got started and you can go as far back as you want. Yeah, thank you. Well, I always knew that I wanted to do my own thing, but I really was a very, very good student. I think our school system, at least the one that I was in, in the south of the U.S., trained us to be really good employees. And so I really fit. I checked all the boxes. I got the grades. I got the scholarships. I knew I was teacher's pet. I knew how to do school, right? And so when I got out of school, I had this dream to be an entrepreneur, but I I had never been taught how to even really think for myself. I had been taught to learn the thing they told me to learn and do well on the test they told me to take and get the grade. And so I did what you're trained to do and I got a job. And at the very same time, I started my own marketing agency doing different things than you and much smaller than what you do. But I started a side hustle uh, doing uh, online marketing for small businesses. And I had studied media. My first job was as a professor of media. And so I knew how to tell a good story. And I was able to help these small businesses who needed an online presence to establish one. And that was the business that took me out of my nine to five, although it took me five years because I was terrified to fail. I didn't trust myself. And I really just, I really just thought that what I needed was a clear plan. Like, oh, if I could have a plan that I could control and someone would just tell me what to do, then I could go do it already. I could have created a plan. Like I'm a smart person, but I just didn't believe that I knew enough or was enough to do it. And so it took me five years. And when I quit, I replaced my income, my take home income in the very first month. And I was like, why did it take me this long? Right? I was miserable. I was in a really toxic environment. I was like a 90 minute commute, heavy traffic. And it was, I was just really like wasting away in this soul sucking environment. And so I was so happy to get free. And then basically what I did was I created another job for myself in that agency because I didn't know any different. So I just, you know, I had clients that I loved. I was working at home instead of in an office. I wasn't commuting, but it felt like a job again, right? And so I was really pretty close to burnout after five years of doing that full time when I had a turning point that set me on this path. And that was a personal tragedy um, that I had to overcome, which was the full-term loss, the full-term stillbirth of my first daughter. And that was very unexpected. I was just like waiting to go into labor And then I went to a regular doctor appointment and they said, we don't know what happened, but your daughter has passed away. Now you have to go deliver her anyway. And so I really, like, really, my world just kind of burned to the ground because that was so backwards for how I thought life was supposed to go, right? Like you don't outlive your children, you know, especially one that wasn't even born alive. And I, I used that to take a hard look at my life as I grieved and to become determined to do something positive, to create something good out of this experience. And it put myself on a path where I was going to help more people and make a, a legacy so that people wouldn't forget her since she wasn't here to, ma- to make that for herself. And so that's when I got serious about like getting over my fear, 
getting out of my own way, doing the work on myself to figure out what it was that I was the best in the world at, right? My zone of genius. And that's when I started this business, the life with passion. And really what I've done along the way, as we do um, when we're in coaching, coaching or mentorship consulting is I've, I taught things. I've taught things that I had already done and that I felt like I could help other people with. So it started with, I had quit my job. I could help people quit their jobs, right? Then it became like, hey, I made six figures. I can help you make six figures. Then it was like, I can help you do that part-time. Um, Cause I went on to have uh, uh, two other uh, children, living children that are now two and four. And so this business I've always run part-time. And along the way, I developed this hmm, process or method for being a really good guest on podcasts. So it was something that I found out I really like to do. And that um, also happened to uh, attract clients to me that I loved working with. And so people started teaching me, asking me to teach that. So I'm doing that now. Uh, and so here we are. That's interesting. I mean, I love your story and sorry for your loss. Um, I wanted to dig a little bit deeper on the upbringing because you did mention your upbringing was very school focused, right? Uh, did, were your parents uh, involved in the social system like, or were they educators themselves? Uh, were they entrepreneurs? Like what profession? And did you have people along the way that really push you to kind of move away from the corporate, you know, school system as a professor to become an entrepreneur? Or were there like any influences? Great questions. Um, my dad uh, worked in corporate and he and I are similar. He's very impact driven as well and has helped. He's been kind of a right hand to a lot of entrepreneurs. But so I saw that up close. I saw him support entrepreneurs, but his edge was that he did not like or know how, so he didn't want to learn, to market and sell. He just was really uncomfortable with doing that for his own services. And so what wound up happening is he would consult, but then he would get go back to a job because that's where he was comfortable, right? So I saw that my mom stayed at home. I'm the oldest of four. And so um, very conservative upbringing. And so, um, so she stayed at home and, and raised us. And he worked mostly in corporate. Um, and I believe, you know, it wasn't really until my 20s that I started getting to know and pursuing relationships with people who were doing this entrepreneurial thing. So it was kind of like I believed it for other people. Like my college boyfriend was the first person who, my first client, the first person I helped quit his job after college. <laughs> and so I would believe it for other people and I would help them. But it was always like, I wasn't sure that I could do it for myself. I didn't believe in myself as much as other people believed in me, but I did have mentors um, free at first and then eventually, you know, paid uh, and still do to really help me on this journey because I'm the kind of person who tends to only implement um, something that I've paid for, even if it's amazing material. Uh, I, if I don't have like skin in the game, I'm just like, oh, that's nice. But if I pay for it, I show up for it. And so, um, so now I know the value of going, if this is the thing that I want, right. I'm gonna, I'm gonna invest to get the thing. Uh, and so that's, I would say those are, have been my biggest, um, inspirations, up close examples, the people that I've learned the most from. And that's great that you acknowledge that what it takes and what you need to move you along and push you, right? And guide you. Uh, a lot of people aren't aware of it, uh, not self-aware. They, they don't know what they don't know, right? So taking that extra step outside your comfort zone. Um, so another question is, um, I know you have four siblings. And are there any of them entrepreneurs themselves or what do they think of what's going on in your life 
and do they want to replicate? Do they envy you for any of that? Because I have siblings, I'm the fourth child of four kids as well. And it's different because they were all in the educational, like they're all engineers and they have great professions, but they don't even know what I do. They have no idea, they don't care. They think it's like sales and marketing and it's like hokey pokey to them, which is completely fine, but I'm making a living off it and mm-hmm. I'm happy and it's a lifestyle that I chose to go through. Yeah. So I just wanted to ask you in your uh, perspective and your life. That's a really good question. One of my siblings was a wedding photographer for a while. And so she did that. I think um, really just burnt out on that. So no longer, no longer works for herself. Um, I think the... And so, so none of them do. Mm-hmm. I think the the envy is probably the, or the like must be nice. It's probably comes from the perception that I, yeah, of freedom, right? That I get to do what I want, when I want, you know, wearing what I want with who I, right? And that's true. And also I think, the siblings who feel that way are also like not willing to put in the work. Like, I'm like, I'll help you if you want. And they're like, no, 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 no. I'd just rather be over here and be like, that must be nice than actually put in the work. And um, my younger brother, I have a ton of admiration for. He has done very well in his profession and he is a very aggressive saver. Reason being because he doesn't love his job and he wants to be able to retire early. And I'm like, you could, you're so capable. You could do anything that you want. That's the thing that feels safe and right to him is instead to save and retire early. So no, nobody else, you know, I'm the oldest, I'm the only one. But that's great because it's different people's perspective, right? Yeah. And they have different values and they, uh, and you understand that lifestyle choices, mm-hmm. yes, it's a little bit more work and very similar to my siblings, right? Like they see what I do and they kind of like and don't like, but they don't know how hard it is, right? Mm -hmm. So they don't want to put in that additional time early days to to get through that hump and they're comfortable, which is totally fine too. Um, Because certain people in 98% of the population will get a nine to five job where they feel secure. They want that Every day, I need to know what my two-week paycheck's going to be, yep. right? Where a portion of it goes to needs, a portion of it goes to savings and investment, mm-hmm. some goes to purchasing stuff, right? So, which is fine. I mean, that's their thing, right? Yeah, yeah. Um, but we are different. And that's what I mean. Entrepreneurs, until you're a business owner, there's only a small percentage of us that actually get it and will continue doing it because a lot of them give up and will go back to the nine and five. But the ones that have been doing it for five years, 10 years, X amount more years, they understand that we're only a small percentage of population that actually enjoys what we're doing. Right? Mm-hmm, for sure. And that's why, why we do what we do, right? If we weren't enjoying it, it would be easy to go just go get a job where we're also not going to enjoy it. <laughs> But there has to be a taste of some sort of success for you to continue doing it. Totally. If there was no success and you're running around making less than you used to make and mm-hmm. you're more miserable and you're spending more time, then something is not right, right? Totally. Then you have to find a mentor, a coach, or you got to figure it out, right? Which yep. means put in the time, learn skills, learn how to run a business, all these other things. So, but a lot of people give up because they are not cut up for business ownership, entrepreneurship, which is totally fine too, because it's not for everyone. Yeah, agreed, agreed. So growing up, did you have kind of dreams or aspirations to run your own shop? Hmm. At first I wanted to be a vet. That was where I was focused for most of my uh, upbringing because I love animals and so that's what you, think about doing when you love animals, at least I did. And I took uh, advanced biology in high school 
And when I was about 16 and I found myself, I was not a skipper, but I found myself coming up with some reason to not go to school the day that we were going to do a dissection. And I thought this probably doesn't bode very well, but I've spent the last, you know, 12 years because I could think about what I wanted to do thinking I was going to be a veterinarian. And so, um, you know, I'm grateful. I'm very grateful to my parents because they, um, had me take some like preferences type of testing assessments and the the person who did them was very gifted and she said you know i can tell that you want to be a vet but i can tell you that you will struggle in the sciences like you you can do it but you're gonna watch your classmates find it easy because they're more wired for that and that's going to be frustrating to you and that felt really true for me because I'm a great, I'm a writer, I'm a reader, I'm a communicator, but I wasn't taking calculus with my friends. You know, I was like happy to be done with math, right? And so, uh, and and thinking about things like organic and inorganic chemistry, it was just like, you know, I just, I just don't think like that. And so I think she kind of helped me give myself permission to pursue something that was more more creative. I'm, I'm very both brained. Like I love to be organized. I love a schedule. I love a calendar and I love to dream and write and do and, and, and tell stories and be creative. So, uh, so I knew I wanted to do my own thing, like have my own practice. Then it morphed in university into, I was going to run a mar or have a marketing or pr production company with some of my friends who each had like a specialty. Like this one's a great uh, cinematographer. This one's a great audio. This one's great at editing. And I was going to, you know, run the show as the producer because that's my strength. And so that was the idea, but none of us had any idea what we were doing again. And we were all scared and dealing with student loans and like, well, we'll just get jobs. So that was like the next iteration of it. And then after grad school, you know, I, I did a documentary that aired nationally on PBS, right? So if, and all of you listening who are somewhere other than the US, it's like the, uh, the national kind of government funded um, uh, educational television station in the US. And I created a documentary and um, it wound up airing nationally on that network and it wound up winning, winning some awards. And I, it also was such a trust builder with the people that the documentary was about and their clients that they wound up being my first round of clients for my agency. And so I really saw the, the power of building trust, you know, through the media that way uh, and help me get started on my entrepreneurial journey. And that's all you need, right? Yeah, like yeah. one big impact in either PR or influence. Mm -hmm. And then you already have relationships that have been built, right? And harvest. So it's great to share with the audience members, like how you got the ball rolling. Is there anything you would like to add or some of the mistakes that you kind of gone through early stages um, that you maybe now reflect back on that could have saved you some time, saved you some aggravation and stress and, you know, shrunk time? Yeah, so what would I tell the 23-year-old version of me? Uh, yeah, so 16 years ago, I was pretty dedicated to the idea of, even though I invested hundreds of thousands of dollars in schooling, right? I was pretty dedicated to the idea as a young adult of like, I'm going to figure everything out on my own and for free. Otherwise, like that's how I'm going to prove to people that I'm smart. Otherwise, somehow asking for help means like I'm not smart. And so I had a mentor, but he was free. Right. And so I, again, as we discussed, I wasn't really super like taking risks and doing things that he suggested, even though it was super successful and wonderful. So I think that if I could say, Hey, here's, sit across from her and say, hey, here's where you're gonna be the year that you turn 40. And if you wanna be there the year that you turn 30, just take my word for it, do these things. I would tell her to like quit her job, 
right? One year in, I knew that wasn't what I wanted to be doing. So quit your job, trust yourself, find somebody to hold your hand and kick your butt, right? Do whatever it takes to, to pay them to do that and get, start doing mindset work, right? Growth rather than fixed. I see that behind you uh, on your wall of books, which I love and, uh, and put yourself out there, right? And, and, and not hide behind kind of the thing that feels like, oh, well, I guess this is obvious because I studied it, but instead start doing the work to move toward discovering, uncovering, strengthening the zone of genius so that I could have more impact, you know, make more income as a result and help more people sooner. And, and it's so great to hear like finding your superpower, right? Finding your, your zone of genius, but it, it, it's so hard for a lot of entrepreneurs to change that shift from stability and it's the, the life stages of people as well. So if you're early stage, uncertain, maybe you don't have um, influences that you can turn to. Um, you've never been exposed to coaches and mentors. You yeah. don't even know what it takes because you, you don't know what business ownership is all about, mm-hmm. right? And then looking back, because now you've been doing it for X amount of years, it's like, even myself, I'm like, I should have started five years earlier. If I knew what I knew today, I would have tried to figure it out sooner, mm-hmm. make more mistakes earlier to get me close to, to where I am today, five years ago, right? Mm-hmm. But it's a lot easier to say that now when you have perspective of a bigger range of, you know, years in, I would say, because you become more wise. You right. have more, you know, different perspectives on life in general, people you, you deal with, touch, work with, everything, right? Um, Mm -hmm. And so therefore, I actually love speaking to people that are 60, 70, 80 year olds, Mm -hmm. entrepreneurs Mm -hmm. that give me so much wisdom. Mm -hmm. And those are the people that I love just going for coffee, lunch, having conference calls and Mm -hmm. talking to them because they have so much wisdom in there that even if you take one piece of advice, it's worth thousands of dollars. Yeah, totally. It's It's such a good point. Yeah. So, you know, and, and the, the thing is in business ownership, there's only, there's people that you can help that are slowly getting to where you are. At. So it's mm-hmm. not like you can be an expert overnight, right? So like you mentioned, you pivoting because you know that all these people below you or even beside you are struggling. They need support. They need help. And you've already gone through those situations so you can help them using your years of experience and expertise so it's not like you have to be a 10 on the expert level you can be a three and help the one and twos oh so so true right so just trying different things and being an entrepreneur means yes it's tough yes there's struggle yes there's a lot of you know challenges that everyone has to overcome but that mind if you think you can do it you probably can like why is there doubt why are you doing something? And, um, you know, I, I'm very fortunate to not just have read a lot, but meet a lot of interesting people mm-hmm. along the way. So it's, it's fun, right? And totally. that's the whole purpose of why we're here. Like having fun is the number one thing, what you should be doing, no matter what. Agreed. Yep. <laughs> so in terms of like business ownership today for you, what does it mean compared to when you first started? Because now it's different, right? You have years of it in and you're probably, your goals are a little bit different. Mm -hmm. Has it always been the same values? Is that, has it always been the same kind of avatar that you reached out to Mm -hmm. and want to resonate with? Or does it change as you mature into your business ownership, entrepreneurial journey? Great question. I would say my avatar was pretty steady in my agency. Uh, and really my agency was a, fr- a freelance gig, like, cause it was me because I was terrified to delegate. I 
would not consider myself like a natural manager of people. And so, and I was a control freak, right? And so nobody could do it as well as I could. So therefore I wouldn't let anyone. And of course that led to burnout. Now I have kind of lean into this idea of letting people support me. So now I have a small team that I do manage and meet with, and I'm always working to be a better leader too, uh, since that doesn't come naturally to me. But it has become a lot more about living living in my superpower, living in my, in my zones, right? And really once those are identified, it's pretty easy to say, is this that or not, right? But I think, I think like the thing is, as I'm growing and scaling this business, every day I come so face to face with like my shortcomings or like the stuff that I intend to do that I don't get to, or, you know, my perspective on, oh, my calendar's too full. Well, Christine, you have full control over your calendar, right? How about you, how about you like have a perspective shift about that, right? So it's just a constant, and you, I, you know this, I'm sure, like just a constant growth. Um, and that said, the type of person, my avatar is completely different than it was when I started this business six years ago. Then I was working with women who just hated their jobs. They didn't know what they wanted to do. And they, um, you know, they wanted out of their engineering job. They wanted out of their teaching job. They wanted to find something else that they, that they could do online. And now, you know, while I have these, these amazing humans who I'm helping to create their first six figures in business, I also have this arm of the business that is, um, that is helping people get on podcasts. And those people are at multiple six, seven, I just signed a client yesterday who's made over eight figures online. And like, I am far from that, right? And I'm like, wow, this is a different level of person who's taken risks and expertise and all of that, that I get to be in the room with and I get to support with my thing. And that's both terrifying and really exciting because we have the same values of, of impact and mission and you know, and service. And so to get to be in the room with and support those types of people, like that's always been my dream. It was just finding a way to do that where I could congruently say, yeah, I can help you with that. Because if I'm teaching people over here to make six figures, those people don't need me because they've already made eight. Do you know what I mean? So now it's like, oh, okay, this is a different way that I can serve them. And we can still be in the same virtual room, we can still be peers, you know, while I'm growing in that way, which I love. Yeah, and as you mature in your business, and at the beginning, you mentioned about leadership, right? Yeah. From a contractor, freelancer, gig kind of employee to then um, delegating, learning how to let go of control. And once you start doing that, that shift of, you know, it's even mindset, right? Of trying to understand like, what is your role today? Because mm-hmm. now you've gotten away from the day-to-day grind of things that you hate doing. So you hire mm-hmm. for all the tasks that you hate doing, mm-hmm. focus on what you enjoy doing. Then you control your schedule in yeah. your calendar so that what's most important, if you value family, if you value health, if you value meetings, if you value clients, put that in and nothing should overtake that then you have control of really your life, right? Because not just business, but you put that out there and people realize that, look, these are things that matter for me most Mm -hmm. and everything else can wait. And that's hard for a lot of people to move move away from that contractor gig kind of mentality because that's what their DNA has equipped them with. But you mentioned you're always learning. So you're the type like myself who wants to grow, right? Mm -hmm. So taking on that new initiative of of growing and understanding that there's much more potential if you let go, Mm -hmm. if you learn by leading, if you then become working on your business as opposed to in. But that was a shift that everyone has to take in entrepreneurial business journey 
to get to the next level, to really challenge your, you know, skill level and expertise, because it's different. Scaling a business is different than only working with a handful of clients. Yes. Yes. Whew. Yeah. I think that having, having mentors up close, I joke that I am willing to get coached within an inch of my life, <laughs> but it's true because, you know, I went on a coaching call the other day. It's a small group of people. And I'm crying about something that happened. And another time I'm, you know, having a conversation about something that I'm scared about doing a business and I start sweating. And another time I get lightheaded and I feel like I'm going to pass out. Like these are all things that my body and my nervous system are trying to process all these changes that I'm constantly putting myself uh, into. And, you know, we're not wired. We're not wired for change. We're wired for safety. We're wired to stay alive. Right. And so when we recognize these opportunities that we have, it's like, at least for me, my body and my nervous system clearly haven't caught up with these unlimited opportunities and possibilities that we have in business today. And the, uh, and so my job is to kind of bridge that gap and be like, is this fear real? Like, am I actually going to die if I put up a post on Facebook or reach out to this influencer or that person? If not, okay, thank you, right, for trying to keep me safe. But most of it is most of it is like self-regulation. Like you said, you know, I just got back from the gym, right? Taking care of myself so I don't burn out because I love to work. And so I could very easily work all the time and then look out, look up and be like, I don't like this anymore only because I'm tired, you know? And, but then also just consistently working on this, this person, my skill sets the ways that I make it hard when it doesn't have to be hard and the, the way that I show up in, in business and, and really, really, and truly like at this point, it's just with the help of my coaches and mentors, because I know that when I read a book, I might like it, but somebody said, it's like you're in your own jar and you can't read the label. So I love to read. Um, I'll read a book in a day if I have time to myself and I'm got probably going to be like, that was cool and not actually implement it unless I have somebody there walking alongside me to make sure that I'm willing to get that uncomfortable. Yeah. So that circle of influence is huge, right? Having coaches, mentors, mm -hmm. but if you have colleagues or leadership team or friends or family or people within your support group, yep. so it doesn't have to be coaches and mentors. No. It could be any colleague. It could be people you respect or not respect neighbors it could be anyone yeah. and that's the whole point right finding commonality in people and then gravitating towards their strengths or weaknesses and helping assisting mm -hmm. giving help, making an impact in any sort um so that's why i learned over the pandemic as well like my community is a lot tighter because mm -hmm. i'm spending more time with the people that surround me right uh in my neighborhood Anyways, mm -hmm. not in the business world because I can't see them. <laughs> right. Um, I used to go to conferences and all that. Yeah. But it's pivoted. It's changed. And that's fine as well, as long as you're making the most of it. Mm -hmm. And that's the whole aspect of you learning to pivot because you know there's a strength there and there's a need in the marketplace. So you being an entrepreneur, it's like, what is the need out there? And you're filling the gap with your own personal experience or expertise that you can help people who are willing to pay for a service that you know you can help and serve. Yeah, exactly. And like you said, you know, there are so many people with so much knowledge in all of our lives, right? However we connect with them, whether it's online, whether it's the neighbor next door, right? And I think one of my favorite quotes uh, that I often refer to when I find myself like thinking or wondering, am I going to take advice from that person? Am I going to believe what they said about me? Like whether it was critical or uh, anything positive, whatever is like, and you alluded to this, would you take advice from that person on the thing that you are, that they're get right? Like, that they are advising you on with or without your permission. So are you gonna ask the sad 
sadly single person how to be happily married their entire life. Are you going to ask the person who eats McDonald's every day how to like get a six pack and, you know, live forever? Like you could if they're your partner or your sibling or your neighbor, but does it make sense to? No, because talk is cheap, right? So what Darren Hardy said, the way he said it was only take advice from someone you would trade places with. So the other day I had somebody who was thinking about working with me and I knew because we had had a call that they really weren't selling anything and they really hadn't sold anything this year. And they're thinking about hiring me to do like get on some podcasts and, and, you know, do it with my method. And they sent me this really long message. They actually had the invoice in the contract. Like they had given me multiple yeses and they sent me this long message that was basically like, you have no idea what you're doing. We're going to go with the big name in the industry and you should really know, and you should really pay attention to what they're offering and you should price your services and your packages accordingly because they're the best in the business and they've been doing it for eight years. And honestly, it caught me at a really sensitive moment and I cried. I was like, question everything. Oh my gosh, this is terrible, whatever. Like I felt like this little girl who'd been shamed and condescended to. And when I came out of that, because it was obviously triggered something for me, right? Wasn't this particular person. When I came out of that, I realized, you know what? Why would I listen to them? They're not making any money. They don't know this industry. They're choosing someone over their perception of prestige. And they have no idea what either of our distinctives are. And they didn't bother. They were just looking at price tag. And, and so it's like, you know what? I don't even want to work with someone like that, right? I want to work with somebody who understands the value of what I do. And it was like, no, I wouldn't trade places with them. I don't want their business. Like, right. Let's put up, let's, let's put like a, what's the word? Hmm. Teflon bounce right back. Right. And I think that's really important because especially early stages, and this is early stages of this part of my business for me. So I feel more vulnerable around it than something I've been doing for six years early stages of any business or any new venture, we tend to really look for validation, right? We want people to make us okay. We want other people to tell us like, yes, that's a good idea. We care what people think. And often I find that, I think the reason that I go so much to coaches and mentors is because I'm not surrounded by other entrepreneurs. And so they might have all kinds of advice for me, but it doesn't make sense for me to take it because they have no idea. Right. And so, so the people who are, yeah, let's talk about it. But I wouldn't take advice from somebody who's worked at the same company for 20 years on how to scale a business. Right. And I think though, that our, our friends, our family, like a lot of times when we're starting something or starting something new, like they, they want us to stay safe. Like they might be saying something out of genuine concern and it might come across like a criticism to you. But if you can remember that, like, are they happy in their work? Like, doesn't mean you can't love them, but are they, do they have the thing that you want in their work or in their business? If so, yeah, maybe listen to what they're saying. But if not, I would be curious about this for you, John. I realized that like the people who've judged me and have like gone out of their way to criticize me and say, you know, whatever things that stick with me, of course, as negative things do. None of them have been at the same level or further ahead of me in business. Like those people are staying in their own lane, focused, encouraging. Hey, you're on the same journey. Let's help each other out. The people who are behind me are the ones who've been the most critical. Have you found that to be true? Yeah. So for me, I, I put blinders up mm -hmm. for a lot of things Yeah. and I keep them separated. Family mm -hmm. is different because I'll love them unconditionally. Of course. But they have no business um, input in yeah. what I'm doing. Yeah. And I don't ask them for advice either. Right. Because they have no clue what I do anyways. Right. So uh, for me, I, I know there's communities out there. And I respect certain people in different industries that are further ahead. Mm -hmm. um, or people that I like <laughs> listening to, talking to, whatever that I like hanging out with and I'll reach out and just throw them a message, right? Mm -hmm. So you kind of, and you read people, 
And it's very similar to when you're, you're starting your business, you take on any client because you don't know what you don't know. Yeah. So you're going to make a ton of mistakes. You're going to get really bad clients. They're going to judge you no matter what. You're very, very um, critical on every aspect of the interaction from process systems to the, the whole engagement, right? And then after loyalty as well. And that's fine as well, because now as you're further along, you kind of know who you want to work with. You will ask the right questions. You will engage properly, knowing mm-hmm. your list of how you differentiate you, USP, price, benefits, all that value and all that stuff. And then it's okay if they move away and pick someone else because you know what you different in the, the industry and what you're bringing to the table. So as you mature and you become wise in entrepreneurship, you also become better in knowing who you are, who you want to work with, who you want to resonate and you know, align yourself with and connect with. And this only takes, it, it all boils down to time in. Mm-hmm. because mm-hmm. it's the lifeline of a business you either stick it out do it yeah. and continue enjoying it growing and you know making mistakes but growing along the way or you give up mm-hmm. right and fail but there's a lot of people who you know fail and give up but fail and give up or fail and try and fail and try and that's okay too yeah right totally because it's not like the first hit of entrepreneurship is ever going to be a success. It usually isn't for most businesses. So it's okay, right? There's a lot of people out there going through the same challenge as you are. You just have to go find them. There's yes. thousands of them out there. So it, it's interesting that you're bringing this up because I, I feel it. I know what you're going through, especially mm-hmm. if it's a new journey. Mm-hmm. I have a lot of different marketing initiatives. I have a lot of projects and it's fun. As long as you're enjoying the process, yeah. it's okay. Mm-hmm. so I, I just wanted to ask you a couple questions because yeah. i know um we're coming to the end of this podcast can you share with some of the audience members like right now i know you have two ch- child mm-hmm. um and you've been in business for a while mm-hmm. you've learned a lot in corporate and you know edu- being an educator what would you have done different and also um, what are some of the major pillars that you see in your life today, as opposed to when you first started your business? Mm. So, yeah, I definitely would have started sooner. I would have gotten help sooner, both to help me run the business and to help me learn to be a better entrepreneur, business owner, leader. I think I I think I would have given myself a lot more permission to try things and not be perfect. Definitely like have that tendency to procrastinate and be perfectionist. And also really to play small because, you know, I was, I picked up early in life that the way to get attention, positive attention was to be nice, not to be like anything but nice. And so to be a people pleaser. And so to make sure everybody else was okay and not really pay attention to what I needed or wanted to the point where I didn't even know after a while, because I was so used to being whatever you want. Oh yeah. Okay. That's fine. Right. And not even checking in with myself. So what I'm working on today as a person is more around like that whole happy fulfilled life because I do know my tendency I mean the name of my company is life with passion right if I'm just gonna work all the time that's not congruent while I love my work I'm also acutely aware that I can't work all the time I have two little kids you know and so I think a big shift that I've been very conscious of making is putting my putting my fun and my self-care and all of that, like you were saying, on the calendar first. And then business goes around that. So I trust myself to take care of my clients and 
where I'm having to really practice and heal some stuff is okay. And take care of your body, take care of your mind, like be present with your family. These things might sound like, of course, to someone else. Well, to me, these are some of my lessons to learn, you know, do things like meditate, do things that help you stay in possibility rather than in lack and stress, because those are always the first things to go when we get busy. Right. And now that I'm, I, you know, this, in this new part that's taking off, I can f- feel myself kind of reverting to old ways. Uh, and so it's being very, very, uh, practicing those things a lot. And then also looking at how my values translate to how I'm raising my, my own children rather than this is what people say you should do. So for instance, like I realized one day that I was talking about the challenges with what I see my clients dealing with and what I've dealt with coming out of a standard US school, grade schools. But then I was like, I'm gonna have school-aged children one day and I cannot congruently put them into the same system if I want them to grow up with a growth mindset instead of whatever, my perception that they're gonna be taught to the test or that you know they're gonna be, they're not gonna be met where they are, the confidence and all this stuff that I, that I want to continue to foster in them. They've been home for a year and a half anyway, right? Because the pandemic, so it hasn't even been an option. But now I'm thinking about what kinds of alternatives what weird things am I going to be doing to raise my kids the way that I, that I believe is going to give them the biggest chance? And then how do I align the business to that? Yeah. And I guess it's a moving part, right? Like, because totally. as you, you know, mature as a mom, as you become more wise as a business owner, you're going to have to grow. You're going to, yeah. you know, pivot. You're going to change along the, the lines of what is being thrown at you, just like this pandemic. No one knew that you're going to be out of school, right? And right. everything web-based. Um, but we humans, we're, you know, creatures that can adapt to change and mm-hmm. resilience in terms of like what's out there and opportunists and, you know, just trying to stay positive. And that's internal strength. Mm-hmm. And if you understand how to take care of yourself, your people, your family, your mm-hmm. health, then everything will eventually come out of it better, right? Yeah. So I really want to thank you, Christine. Um, Is there any final thoughts uh, or any suggestions or input or um, any any added value you can share with the audience members and listeners um, on business ownership before I ask for your contact information? Mm. Well, I think I just want to reiterate what you said, which is, if you, if you take care of yourself, take care of your family, take care of your mind, take care of your body, like that's going to make it possible for you to figure things out, right? To figure out the things that are feeling stressful or overwhelming or unknown. And I love this quote by a man named Charles Swindoll, who said, this is the paraphrase, I believe that 90% of life is made up of how we respond to the 10% that happens to us. You know, and I can speak as somebody who's been through significant trauma and PTSD and all of this stuff in the last decade, it really is a choice. It really is a choice in how you're gonna respond and in the perspective that you choose in um, what you think about, right? And how you act. and we have unlimited choices and we might've been trained or taught or conditioned to think in certain ways. But I think that's the most powerful shift that you can make is recognizing just how at choice you are. And so no matter where you are in your business building journey, like that's always going to be true and you can really start to practice it now. That's amazing. Well, thanks a lot for those final words, Christine. So how can some of the listeners get in touch with you? If you don't mind mentioning your website, your offer, if you have one, um, or the best way to reach out to you. Yeah. So probably the best 
thing to do is to grab my free podcast guesting checklist. And that also will link you up with like the Facebook group where I hang out and get you in touch with all of my places. It's just one easy place that you can go to grab it. And it's at bit.ly slash podcast hyphen guesting hyphen checklist. Perfect. It's going to be on the show notes. And um, well, thanks a lot. I really want to appreciate your time and thank you for all the valuable input and, you know, your story uh, that you shared with all the audience members. So thanks a lot, Christine, for uh, all this podcast. And hopefully it made an impact on people who are listening today. Thank you so much for having me. This was really fun. (laughs) Thank you.